السلام. Our dearest viewers from across the world, we extend our condolences to you upon the mourning anniversary and the murder anniversary of our dear third Imam, Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, and his companions and his family. in the land of Karbala, in the land of anguish and pain. And we extend these condolences even further to our awaited Saviour. May Allah hasten his reappearance. And we ask Allah to allow us to be amongst those who get to avenge the blood and the death of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Over these nights, we've done our utmost to try and help you, the followers of Ali Muhammad, to try and connect with the tragedies that befell upon Ali Muhammad on that tragic day on the 10th of Muharram, both through trying to take lessons from their masa'ib, but also to connect through the means of poetry and emotion. And combining these two, we truly believe that this will assist you as you try to go from Muharram back to day-to-day -day life in trying to ensure that you've taken lessons, you've taken steps, you've got something practical to take away and implement so that this Muharram wasn't just surface level crying, rather it went a little bit further. And as always, I'm honored to be joined by my dear brother, Ali Fadl, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And we are now in the days of the Shahada and we've looked at Al-Qasim alayhi salam, we've looked at the companions in particular Hur. And tonight we look to the son of Imam Hussein alayhi salam none other than the one who resembled the prophets, as close to the prophets as they say at that time, which was Ali and Al-Akbar uh, into his 20s. Historians say a man who had such valor, who came from such a pure lineage to that extent. And I mean, we can talk of the fadail of Ali and Al-Akbar, but your, your initial thoughts perhaps? On yeah, so uh, Ali Al-Akbar, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, assalamu alaykum to, to the dear viewers. Ali Al-Akbar as, as you mentioned, he was the closest resemblance to the Prophet. Um, even when he would recite the Adhan, mm. people would um, turn and, and feel like the Prophet is around them. When they missed the family of, the, of, of, the, of Imam Hussain, when they missed the Prophet, they would always go towards Ali Al-Akbar and speak to him and look at him because of his face and how he resembled him. To the extent it was um, in manners, in uh, I think it was the three things in which he resembled uh, in terms of his manners, in terms of how he looks, and in terms of um, uh, his, his, his piety as well. Uh, and that's how much he resembled the Prophet. And today, I mean, from an emotional point of view, Ali Akbar salam, was the first without hesitation to be sacrificed by Imam Hussain mm -hmm. Again, the same way that when we remember the sacrifice of, uh, uh, of Tafal al-Radhi'ah, Abdullah al in, in, in that when Imam Hussein took the Fala he was showing to the people that I'm not after any power, I'm not after any wealth or, or money or politics. This is purely to revive the teachings of, of, the, of my grandfather, Rasulullah. In that same context, he was the first to say, My son. is to be sacrificed because you find for example within leaders and leadership their own family members are very well protected when it comes in the face of adversity but when it when it was Imam Hussain he wanted to show everyone again I'm not here for any greed or power I and to the extent I will be sacrificing my son I like about and he would be, he would be the first from the Bani Hashim to go into battle I sense exactly that's and I think The, the, the point that I, wanna, I, I would like to explore initially um, for Ali and Akbar is that we, we, we look to Karbala as, as a, a day of complete and utter almost mayhem and tragedy and so many different words to describe it. And sometimes we actually lose that connection between, okay, this 
was a, an absolute manic day, but it wasn't just the day in itself in terms of the, the actions that were done that made it so tragic. I feel sometimes we actually lose the context in saying this wasn't just a family of any sort of family. This wasn't just a man, any sort of man. The tragedy you could even say is not so much in the way that they were killed, but rather who was actually killed. The, 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 I, I read somewhere recently, I can't remember where, but it, it was a, a paraphrase from just a, a writer talking about, it's a shame that we remember the main pain of Imam Hussein to be his thirst rather than anything else, rather than his actual pain of how the religion was trying to be distorted by those on the other side. And it was no doubt that was of more pain to him than the thirst that he had. And Ali and Akbar السلام, was not just the son of a man. He was the son of an Imam السلام. And that needs to be remembered whenever we commemorate Ashura. Don't try and disconnect the the tragedy that befell in that the physical pain that they had to endure. Don't disconnect that away from who was actually involved. For the person itself, Imam al Hussein السلام, the actual musibah upon him, as we just said, was more that the religion was being usurped by the so-called caliphs at the time. And that in itself was the main masai of Imam Hussein, that he had to fight against this or defend the religion. And of course, Ali al Akbar was looking up to an Imam as well as his father. So what I wanted to touch upon was to try and emphasize and understand this level and maqam of an Imam. Just a few ahadith to reflect upon. And the first of which is this, which comes from our holy seventh Imam, Imam al Kadhim, where he says, and he talks about, he refers to a verse in Qur'an, Surah number 64, verse number 8, where it says, فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِهِ وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, to have faith in Allah and His Apostle, وَالنُّور and the light that we have revealed unto you, have sent down. So Imam al-Kadhim looks to this verse and he says, Imam is the light. And that is the, and that is, so this, this whole verse that is talking about looking and that looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Rasul, and then it refers to the nur. That nur is, he is saying, is the light, is actually the imams themselves. That is the maqam of the a'imma alayhim salam Imam al Baqir alayhi salam says, if the imam was to ever be removed from the earth, even for an instant, the whole earth would tremble in its inhabitants the way the ocean trembles with those who are on it. I.e., if you stand on the ocean, you tremble, that's it, you crumble. Similarly, if you stand on the land, it would be the same that if an imam was taken from there, you just wouldn't be able to live, you, you wouldn't be able to stand. Such is the level of the a'imma alayhim as -salam. And why? It's, it's, it's great saying these ahadith, but why? And very similar, on a very surface level, it's to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a perfect religion. Created the sharia whereby if we abide by it, we can become amazing human beings. And in order to give us the best chance to become the best humans, He had to send down individuals that could portray and illustrate this message in nothing but a perfect way. And hence the a'imma alayhim salam were provided to us, infallibles. And that is why the level of the a'imma is so key. And finally, the Prophet says, Verily, your imams are your representatives before Allah. They're your representatives before Allah. Therefore, be careful whom you follow in your religion and your prayers. If the Prophet's warning saying, they are your representatives in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, imagine having the audacity to try and murder that imam. So now we're going from the step of Yazid murdering a man, which is brutal in itself. But now we're saying Yazid is murdering an Imam and we're saying Yazid is murdering a man who should have been his Imam, who should have been his representative to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such was the mistake, such was the tragedy. And we emphasize this point for the very simple reason that Ali al Akbar salam, his own father, this is what he looked to him as. He looked to him as his Imam. 
someone that he had to obey because this was the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his own father. And of course, it's one of the most tragic masa'ib of the whole event of Karbala when Ali al Akbar has actually fallen. Even as he walks to the battlefield, then Imam al Hussein just steps behind him and he's walking and following because he's, whilst he's giving his son, he, he's still a father. He doesn't want to just see his son off into this and he wants to watch every single thing that happens. And when Ali al Akbar falls, and then eventually Imam Hussein goes to him and Ali al Akbar is covering his chest, and Imam Hussein has to take that out from him, that spear out from his chest. I mean, we, we can't, I don't think there's any way to describe even fathom the strength that Imam must have had. Yeah. Must have had. And as you were saying, Imam Hussein would watch very tentatively at uh, his son's performance on the battlefield. Um, and at the same time, his mother Layla would be watching uh, her husband's face to see the fate of her son. And if, if his face was smiling and bright, then she would know that he was doing well in the battlefield. And if there was a bit of concern, then she'd know that, uh, that she should fear for the life of her, of her son. And there was a time when he would say to her, she, he, had, he had real concern on his face. And she said to, he, she said to him, what's wrong? Uh, oh, oh, Hussein, is, is something happening to my son? And he said to her and very calmly, go back into your tent and pray because the prayer of a mother is very strong in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so she goes back and she prepares herself and she prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she says, the one, oh the one who returned Yusuf to Ya'qub, return my son Ali to me just one last time before he passes away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted her that, that wish and he returned back. Although when he first returned back, he said to his father, oh father Hussein, I am thirsty. And then Hussein replies to him, feel the tongue, feel my own tongue and see that if I had anything I would give you but I am, it's, it's barren lands and I couldn't give you, he couldn't give anything to her but he said to Ayla Akbar, go and visit your mother for one last time so she goes, he goes into the, into the tent and that's where after the, um, the discussion that happened and, and the, the final farewell for Ayla Akbar salam, it's the lamentation of a mother that um, I want to share inshallah with you. It says from the poet Tahar Adil, and this is the words of uh, Layla, the mother of Ali Akbar I stand alone, gazing at the stars as they may answer a burning question. Where does my son Ali Akbar lie? As alone I wait for my son's return. Alone I stand and alone I ask Will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? Within these tents only my shadow Holds on to my heart and within its hand I gaze out and no one comforts me But an unsure path and the burning suns And only the stars I have to ask Will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? A heart heavy with my screams and cries And alone I must bear its weight on me For this rose was everything to me My path, my future, the soul within me 
I bear this weight and with grief I ask Will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? With his absence, the whispers in me Tell me, oh beloved, for you does not care I answer every whisper with hope I know my absence, my beloved can't bear and yet the doubt in my heart It asks, will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? A trail and stain with my son's blood Taunts this mother's soul With the hint of death with every taunt my heart longs to cease And calls for death to take away my breath A mother with her son's absence asks Will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? Beside me sits only my patience As tonight patience is my only friend When once my son was my one true friend And I truly thought would be till the end and with this uncertainty I ask Will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? I raise my hands with tears in my eyes And my heart it cries Lord answer this prayer like you returned Yosef to Yaqub Return my beloved, my Ali Akbar And this mother's womb for him it asks Will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? How can my eyes settle until they see the portrait of my beloved's beauty? How can the weight of my heart's dark grief rest when it abides in this tragedy? And every beat of this heart it's us Will my son return? Will my son return? Will my son return? Many thanks to the poet Nuri It's, it's that, that almost fear of, well not fear but anticipation that will he return, will he return he returns and that, then there's probably that yearning again, please return again and they, you never want it to stop. And there's, with any parent, with their children, there's that level of almost pride that they have for their child. You know, it's from, from when you're young and you, you do a play and you know, it's the innocence of that right the way through to something as, as intense like this. There's, there's that pride that parents have for their children, they want to have for their children. And we, we've spoken about the notion of respecting your parents quite a few times over the past few days because it's, it's, a, it's a repeating theme during the event of Karbala and on the day of Ashura. But one thing that we really note with the relationship of Ali and Al-Akbar and his dear father Imam Hussain Ali salam, was that of pride of Imam Hussain for his son. A, a man who is 
so proud of what his son has achieved, who is, when he goes to the battlefield, is, is content with how he's performing, as you said earlier. And it's something that I wanted to explore ever so slightly with us, which is to what extent are our parents actually proud of us? Or more specifically, to what extent is our father, our father proud of us? What have we actually done to make them proud of us? Or have we just lived a life that completely doesn't involve them? We haven't listened to what they've advised us. We've kind of gone down our own track. And how, if they're not proud of us, how does it then make them feel? How does it then leave them? Imam Sajjad salam in Rasalat al huquq where he talks about the rights of different relationships, the one way he says the rights of the father, it's, it's beautiful. I'm just going to read this out to you where he says, and the right of your father is that you should know that he is your root and you are his branch. And without him, you would not be. Whenever you see anything in yourself which pleases you, you should know that your father is the root of its blessing upon you. So praise God and thank him in recognition of that. And there is no power but in God. And some of the commentary actually says about this where they say there's a weird almost balance that happens when, when a son starts to grow up, the father actually starts to get older. So the son is getting more and more powerful and stronger by the day and hence this willpower to disobey actually starts to fill them. And equally the father becomes more and more frail day by day and maybe their impact upon the son becomes less and less in terms of the the intensity that they can have in training their son. And what can actually happen is a power shift in that when you're born, the father is definitely superior to the son. And we need to be cautious that whilst we get stronger as sons and our parents or our father gets weaker, are we taking that for granted and then actually thinking we're superior to our father? So are we actually, when they say to us, actually, Sadiq, why didn't you try this? I'm like, Dad, you know, don't worry. I, I've got this covered, I know how it works. And it's a scary thing. It's a really, really scary thing. And it's, you know, when, especially when you start to reach the age of your late 20s, 30s, 40s, that's where that balance can really start to shift. And it's something that we must be very, very mindful of. And if we try and then relate that to Karbala, it's that moment exactly like you say when Ali al Akbar goes back and Imam Hussein said, you know, the dialogue, the dialogue where it's all about uh, place your tongue in, into my mouth and see if, if there's anything you can extract, any water. And it's so symbolic of a moment of a son going to their father who has given them everything on a plate since their birth. But at that one moment, his father has nothing, absolutely nothing. And maybe for us, our pride could have got the better of us in that moment and said, you know, this old man, I'm not surprised, you know. Us in that moment could have had that pride or in our day to day when we go to our father, like, oh, you know, did you pick up that food? Oh, you know, okay, it was, you know, it's kind of your role, you know. Comments like that, that would break a father's heart. Yeah, Ali and Al-Akbar's response is, you know, I had no idea. I Almost like just begging for forgiveness of it and I, I'm just gonna, you know, go, go straight back. I, I can't even believe I tried to put my father through that torment. It's, and how can we reflect to that? Whilst we get this slow increase of power and pride, how can we ensure that we control it? And perhaps it's drawing inspiration from Ali and Al-Akbar and the way in which he is with his father at that moment. So maintain that respect. For they were of course the ones who cradled you when you were young. And when your mother was taking care of you at home, they were the one out bringing the food home. They were the ones supporting the family. They were usually the one perhaps doing things behind the scenes that you never actually realized. The benefits that you've had, the education that you've received, the lessons of Quran that you received, a lot of this could have come from your father driving you around when, as we all know, when you get into the world of work, weekends are a luxury. All of a sudden, 9 a.m. to drop you to a madrasa for 9.30, and wait in the car park for three hours, and then you buy them food, da, 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 all these little things. Are we going to have the humility 
that when they end up in a moment where they can't drive anymore or they can't lift this up anymore, are we going to be running to them or saying, actually, wait, I've, I've got something better to do? Take inspiration from Ali and Al-Akbar, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, just just the, the relationship um, of, of Imam Hussain and Ali Al-Akbar, you, you, we mentioned pride, uh, and I think that's probably the, the, the biggest um, the biggest thing that really comes to life uh, when it comes to uh, Ayil Akbar's stand uh, in Karbala. But from a, from a tragic point of view, it's, it, his actual, the actual story of, of how he um, was murdered uh, in Karbala was that ha whilst he was fighting Ayil Akbar salam and, and, and managing to, to slay one after the other, the blood um, either from him or from his enemies would, would gush onto the horse of Ayil Akbar And for this, this is, this is really key because most of, most of the companions when they fell, they weren't in the enemy camps when they fell. They were in and around what's called no man's lands in between the two camps. And, and for that, as soon as they scream or they shout to uh, Imam Hussain Salam, uh, Ya Aba Abdullah Adrikni, come and help me, and that's when the enemies would disperse because it's, it's, it's more or less over for that companion. And Imam Hussain would, would come. But for this, he, Imam Hussain had to travel a lot a further period because the horse, w with blood over his eyes, he didn't know which way to go. Uh, and so instead of carrying Ayil Akbar, who was wounded, heavily wounded, to the camp of Imam Hussain, he carried him to the camp of, of Yazid. And they had no mercy in what they were uh, and what they would, and what they did to him in terms of the, the the brutality, yeah, the brutality and the knives and the swords and the spears, um, and so when he heard, managed to hear it, my uh, Akbar's voice, yeah, oh father, help me or save me, Aba Adrikni. By the time he reached and he saw the dust settled, Ayil Akbar was in pieces, and that's what um, the narrations say that he was technically in in, in pieces, and he had to. Um, drag him back to the camp of Imam Hussain So, so here, it's it's um, the the poem is about uh, Imam Hussain Salam describing what he sees of Ayil Akbar. I saw you turn, Ali, my son, Ali, my son. I saw you turn. I saw you on the dust lying For your father you were crying Now in my arms you are dying Ali my son Ali my son Ali I sit here and I gaze into your eyes I wonder how I shall still live with your demise This beautiful flower within my two arms lies Though ripped and torn, you're still beautiful in my eyes when you cry out that scream of death, my heart it cries And Ali, when your soul leaves you, my soul shall die I cry a scream, farewell Ali, farewell Ali I cry a scream I cry and weep With death you meet With death you meet I cry and weep I weep on you with tears flowing My heart can't bear this grief knowing That soon from my arms you're leaving Ali my son Ali my son 
Ali, my son, for your blood the swords were thirsty. They did not rest until their blades touched your body. Their metal long to cause for you this tragedy. As I wail, they all rest in tranquility. And with your head broken, they returned you to me. Just like they struck the head of my father Ali. For him I cried, and now I cry, and now I cry, for him I cry. I cry for you, Haydar and you, Haydar and you. I cry for you. I cried when my father told me that this won't be the end for me. For one day they'll take you from me. Ali, my son. Ali, my son. You cannot talk to me, your thirst has made you weak. But I hear you cry as your blood to me it speaks. How do I reply to this blood away I seek? I reply with tears that from my two eyes leak. My tears soothe you as they all flow, as they all flow down my cheeks. As I embrace you, all my tears with your blood meets. Blood on your arms, tears on my palms. Blood on your arms, tears on my palms. Tears on my palms, blood on your arms, your death I greet, with me it meets, with me it meets, your death I greet. Death is soon taking you away, just like the swords upon you pray. With it, it takes away my days. Ali, my son. Ali, my son. I saw you on the dust lying. For your father, you were crying. Now in my arms, you are dying. Ali, my son. Ali, my son. Many thanks to the poet Nuri. Sardar, Allah sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad A masaib that really touches the heart The helplessness of a father in that moment When he sees that horse carrying his son away from him mm. Into such danger And this is why the masaib is so, so emotional And this is why Imam Salih alayhi salam says Those who shed tears when Hussein is mentioned in front of them, will be rewarded by Allah Himself. Even if their tears are as small as the wing of a fly. And Allah will not be pleased with any reward for them less than paradise. Oh, The candle of Hussein you've lit, the candle of Hussein you've lit. Whatever has an eye, today find its eye wet. The tears that flow remind the eyes that may forget these are the days when with the sword Hussein had met. Inshallah, we 
ask for the intercession of Ali and Al Akbar alayhi salam and his dear father, our holy third Imam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We ask for their intercession, we ask for their shifa'a in this life and in the next, and we ask Allah to allow us to be amongst those who can avenge the blood from them that fell in the land of Karbala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Oh, my God.